In this video, we'll be talking about maps. You probably know a lot about maps already from social studies and your experiences in school. But in Earth science, we deal with a lot of different maps. So let's talk about how maps display the Earth. Because a globe is a sphere, a globe is the most accurate model of Earth. But a globe is too small to show many of the details on Earth's surface like roads or rivers. For that, we rely on a map. And now a map is a flat model of Earth's curved surface. Maps can show many details that globes cannot. All maps share common features. For example, map scale refers to the relationship between the distance on a map and the corresponding distance on the ground. You've probably seen this before on a map. Somewhere located in the bottom right hand corner or depending on the type of map, there's this. Because maps aren't life-sized and they're scaled, one measurement on the map is going to be equal to a larger measurement in the real world. The first number is always one, typically something like one inch. The second number is the ground distance. So for this map, with this particular legend, one inch on the map equals 24,000 inches on the ground. So that's how the map is scaled. For some of the maps that we have in our reference table, like this generalized bedrock uh, geology of New York State map, you can find a map scale at the bottom right. Now, it's not exactly the same, but it is telling you the distance on the map that's equivalent to the real life distance. To figure out how far it is, you would use a piece of paper to mark off the beginning and end of a certain interval and now apply that to the map and bring that up to the distance you're looking for. Maps and charts often used shapes and symbols as well as common map colors to designate certain features such as mountains or highways or cities. The map legend is a small box or table on the image that explains what those symbols mean. So on this map, the key, the legend, is displaying the gross domestic product of each nation, what they export. On this map, we're getting a look at the different elevations above sea level, and that's color-coded so it's easier to see. Different maps will carry different types of information, and using the legend uh, or the map key will help you understand what's being displayed. And unless it's noted any differently, you can always assume that north is going to be at the top of the page on a map, and south will be at the bottom. You'll often find a compass rose, which is helpful to understand the directions, but also northwest, northeast, south west and southeast. So there are different types of maps and uh, the maps that we use won't be color coded. Um, so for instance here you have a political map on the bottom, you have a physical map in the upper left, and then you have a you have a solar in the upper right hand corner you have a map showing uh, the amount of solar energy uh, received and that's being converted to electricity. So different types of maps show different types of information. And in Earth science, there's one map in particular that you've probably never seen before. And that's called a field map. Now a field map displays fields. What is a field? A field is a measurable quantity in a 3D space. Common types of fields include air pressure readings, elevation above sea level, air pressure, sea surface temperatures, and sometimes even air pollution. A typical field map would look something like this. These are air temperatures across the United States. And the reason we call this a field map is because the field data is displayed across a two-dimensional map. To make reading a field map easier, we use isoline. Now, isolines are lines that connect points of equal value. So on a field map like this, using isolines, 
makes it much easier to determine where one air temperature ends and the next begins. And the bands that run from west to east on this map give you an idea of where the warmer regions are and the colder regions. Now, just as there are many types of fields and field data, there are also many types of ISO lines. You can have ISO bars that connect areas of equal air pressure. We call that barometric pressure. There could be isotherms. We were just looking at isotherms across the United States. Those connect areas of equal air temperature. And there are contour lines, which connect areas of equal elevation. Those three groups, isobars, isotherms, and contour lines, are the most common types of field data that we'll be dealing with. So how do you use that in Earth science? So here's an example. So approximately how many inches of average yearly precipitation does Rochester, New York receive? So the map is demonstrating, using ISO lines, the amount of precipitation received across the United States. The first question that we have to tackle is, where's Rochester? If you can look at a map of New York State and pinpoint Rochester, that's amazing. The New York State doesn't ask you to do that or, or remember that information. They give you a map that shows all of the cities in New York State. So simply overlaying one on top of the other, I can see, hey, there's Rochester right there. And um, now that if I fade out the other map and I look back at my original map and I put back where Rochester is, I can now get an idea of where it lies. So approximately how many inches of average yearly precipitation does Rochester receive? So where it is right now, if you look very carefully, it's somewhere um, on the left of 32 inches. Okay, so this line of 32, if I follow it all around, anywhere on this line is equal to 32 inches of rain on yearly average. So if I'm not on the line, I have to be less than 32. If I was in this space, then I'd be a number between 32 and 36, because 36 is the next valued line. So I definitely have a value less than 32, but not any lower than 28 and I know that it's not any lower than 28 because if I look at my numbers 32 36 40 44 48 they're going by fours so there's no 28s in this area so this value if this was a real test question and you had to write in your answer it would be totally acceptable if you put in any number between 29 and 31 because that's showing that you're lower than 32 but not as low as 28 because if it was 28, there would be a new uh, line drawn to show that value. All right. Hopefully that makes some sense. But of course, as always, we'll practice in class. One more for you. Uh, the map illustrates the distribution of acid rain over the United States on a particular day. Acid rain is a phenomenon where uh, pollution mixes with rainwater. And as that rainwater drops down, it has a higher amount of acidity. So the ISO lines in this map represent the acidity measured in pH units. And now down on the bottom of this picture, there's a pH scale. If you didn't already know this, the pH scale runs from 0 to 14. And anything on the left from 0 to 7 or 0 to 6.7 is going to be acidic. So anything with a low number in my map is going to be acidic. So according to the pH scale shown below, which region of the United States has the greatest acid rain problem? So when I look across this map, these are all higher values anywhere over here. They're in the fives. As I move this way, I'm getting into the fours. 4.8, 4.6, 4.4, 4.2. So if I had to pick a region with the lowest acidity in their rain, it would be somewhere over here, which would give me the northeast. So that's how we use ISO lines and read field maps. In our next video, I'll show you how to create these maps. Thanks for watching.